So reflexes are divided um, among these different categories, and they've got sucking up here. And I put it here just for now, but because it is important for survival. I mean, you, the, when I think of, of instincts, I think it's something that you don't have to learn. And of course, sucking is not something that you have to get training for. Um, a child is born with the ability or the reflex, um, the instinct to, to suck, because it's important for feeding. So they come equipped with that. Rooting is another one that they come equipped with. And rooting is a really interesting uh, instinct. Anyone ever hear rooting before? So what rooting is if you touch the child's cheek with your uh, finger or your hand and just rub the side, they will orient toward uh, that touch. And what they're doing is trying to uh, locate the source of food, right, which is usually the nipple. So if they do this, they're going to, again, look this way or, or the other way, depending on where you touch. And again, they're seeking out uh, the nipple of the mother's breast for food. And I always make a very um, inappropriate joke about this. And that is that females um, typically grow out of this reflex, whereas males, it tends to last a lifetime. <laughs> in any event. So sucking, again, um, right now it's in survival instincts, but I'm going to qualify this later because you don't have to have food to suck. And in order for a reflex to be a true reflex, the stimulus that incites it has to be present but we know that children can suck on pacifiers they will suck when when different uh, you know stimulation they will suck to pacify themselves so they don't have to have the presence of a nipple or food to do that so it's not really a true instinct it's what we're going to call a congenitally organized behavior and we'll talk about that later there's three of those okay but I just put it here for now because it does make sense that it is a survival instinct Primitive instincts, and I'm going to show you this on the clip. So some of these might become more obvious. I don't like talking about something because you have to try and imagine what it is. But when you see it, you go, oh, yeah, okay, now I get it. So that's why I want to go over this stuff a bit now. And then when you see it, you'll be able to understand what we mean. Well, uh, the primitive instincts are usually what we call precursors for later voluntary motor development. Now, what does that mean? Well, number one, stepping. A newborn child or a, a young infant um, will show this stepping reflex when you put them, hold them up. Now, they can't stand up on their own, clearly. But if you stand them up, they have this ability or this instinct that kicks in where they start to step, right, one foot in front of the other. You don't typically see it um, because most people don't hold up their young child on a treadmill or on a, you know, something where they're going to start this uh, instinct to uh, occur. And it goes away pretty rapidly. Um, that's the other thing about these instincts, the APGAR scale, testing for these various reflexes. Most of these reflexes are present at birth, and they test for them. But they should also disappear after a while. If they don't disappear, then there may be something wrong with the child's nervous system. So not only is the importance or the, the actual appearance of reflexes important, but they should also disappear after a while as well. Now, stepping won't. You, want, you need that for later for walking. But it does go away. And they were wondering, well, why does the stepping reflex go away only to come back later on when you learn to walk? And they thought, well, you know, the stepping reflex is preparing the child for the inevitable behavior of walking, right, later on, which, again, is a voluntary motor behavior that's going to occur later on, about 10, 10 months old. So why does it go away? And it turns out the reason why it goes away is it doesn't really go away. It's just the child can't hold its own weight once they gain, <clears throat> you know, a few more pounds. So if you submerse the child in water, the stepping reflex comes back because now they don't have you know, the weight of, their, of gravity pulling them down. So the stepping reflex doesn't really disappear, although it may seem to. And again, I'll show you this on the clip. So again, these early reflexes are going to show <coughs> the integrity of the child's nervous system. And here's some of them. Um, I'm just going to show you a picture of them, and then I'll explain them on the next slide. So we've got from clockwise here the palmar reflex. And we've got the stepping reflex. Here it is there. The little baby's starting to walk. It's so cute. Um, the moral reflex, and again, it's where the arms stretch out, and I'll, I think, I don't know if I have that or not, a separate clip, I think. And then, of course, the rooting reflex I talked about, where the child is going to orient toward the cheek that's touched in search of food. So I'm just going to skip ahead here to show you what these actually are. So rooting, again, uh, tactile stimulation, that means it can touch, um, elicits the head to turn toward the stimulus, again, looking for um, the nipple. 
Um, the palmar, and again, if you look back here, the palmar is right here. And anyone who has a baby around knows that if you have a child and you put your hand in their little grip, good luck getting your hand away, right? They, they don't know how to let go. They can grip, which is the palmar reflex, but they haven't learned yet how to let go. So you're, you're stuck there. You've got to you know, pull your hand away. Or if they grab an earring or your hair, and they just start pulling. It's almost like, oh, they're doing it on purpose. <laughs> they're not. It's just uh, part of that reflex action. Um, the stepping reflex, again, as I mentioned, and I'll show you that one. And then the moral reflex, where they lose um, support of their he uh, head. Um, if, if they actually feel that they're falling, the, the arms come up like this instinctively. And they believe that this is actually a remnant, uh, evolutionary remnant, uh, when we were walking around are holding on to the bellies, fur bellies, that is, of our mothers, which now I hope is not an issue. <laughs> um, but it's, again, um, the evolution still has the blueprint for these reflexes in our genes, right? So it still can be elicited. Are we good? So here's what I was talking about congenitally organized behaviors. And these don't require an actual stimulus to elicit them. For instance, back here, you have to have you know, the cheek uh, stimulated. You have to have loss of head support to elicit the moral reflex. Um, you have to have something in the child's palm to elicit the palmar reflex. Um, there's another one called the Babinski reflex. And the Babinski reflex is if you stroke the bottom of a child's um, foot, the sole of their foot, the uh, toes fan open. And again, that should go away after you know, a, few, a few months. And that, again, is a sign of central nervous system functioning. So they all require a stimulus. But these are classified as congenitally organized behaviors because they don't require a specific stimulus in order to incite this reflex. So we've got three of them, looking, sucking, and crying. And I think it's pretty self-explanatory that looking, children don't have to have light to look. They're going to be looking around, and they're very curious. Um, naturally anyway. So looking would be, again, you don't have to learn to look. It is a, an actual instinct. But because you don't require a stimulus to incite it, it's called one of these behaviors. The other one is sucking, as I mentioned before. And the third one is crying. So they are instinctual in a sense because you don't have to learn them. But what makes them um, organized behaviors or congenitally organized behaviors is the fact that you do not have to have a particular stimulus to cry. Um, so Crying, for instance, you can convey hunger, um, you know, fear, discomfort, anger, all kinds of things, pain. And it is one way that the children learn to communicate, their first way of communicating with the, the caregiver. Some people argue that these three different kinds of cries are indicative of the child's needs. So the basic cry, for instance, when you're hungry or need to be changed, is a certain type of cry. The angry cry, a little bit more intense, right? And the pain cry, uh, with a child, it starts off very, very quickly. Um, there's almost, you know, intense uh, wailing, and the child gasps for breath uh, during the pain cry. So they often believe that, you know, a parent can tell these three different cries apart and know what their children or what their baby needs. Other researchers say, no, this is not really the case. Um, there are some debate about that. But I think, honestly, parents do get in tune with their child's cry, and it is their first form of communication. So it would make sense that there is some kind of differentiation among these different types of cries.